Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, Ida leaves a trail of destruction from Louisiana to the Northeast. Flooding concerns loom as harvest nears. Exploring the efforts to repel rabies. Right, to find, you know, the balance sheet. And market analysis with Jeff French. Next. I mean, you're talking about a stock. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, September 3 edition of Market to Market the Weekly Journal of Rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The job picture is a complicated one. Several states ended unemployment benefits, but that has yet to translate to massive gains in people going back to work. American employers added 235,000 jobs in August, even as the Delta variant has slowed some economic activity. The unemployment rate dropped two-tenths of a point to 5.2%. Hiring was lower in places that require face-to-face -face contact. Supply chain bottlenecks remain a concern for those surveyed in the Business Conditions Index. The Creighton University snapshot reported a monthly decline, but held at 68.9, well above growth neutral. Now, there was a little more than a decade and a half between the August 29th landfall of Hurricanes Katrina and Ida. The damage to infrastructure was different this time, but the remnants of the recent storm drenched the Northeast. The National Weather Service office in New York City had never issued a flash flood warning until this week. John Torpy wraps up another week that was very wild in weather. Devastating environmental events hit the U.S. on multiple fronts this week. As wildfires grew in the West, drought and flooding mixed in the Midwest, and Hurricane Ida idled shipping on the mighty Mississippi. We expect the river to open from Nine Mile Point out into the Gulf in seven days. And I think the main message uh, to America is that we're gonna get this river open as soon as possible ASAP. While Hurricane Ida mostly spared Louisiana crops, it did not spare the nation's most efficient way to ship them. Ships and barges were scattered on the banks of the Mississippi River causing a stoppage for river traffic just as grain farmers across the Midwest are preparing their combines for the 2021 harvest. We have a lot of ships in the river that are waiting to be loaded. We have a lot of barges in the river that we need to get to the north because that is how we we're going to be able to move the corn and the beans and the grain and the other products up and down the Mississippi River. Hurricane Ida, the fifth most powerful storm to strike Louisiana, made landfall 16 years to the day that Hurricane Katrina struck the Pelican State. The Category 4 storm knocked out power to one million people in Louisiana, and authorities say it could be weeks before power is fully restored. Early damage estimates from Hurricane Ida currently hover around $16 billion, and officials anticipate the final total could be as high as $50 billion. The fourth named storm of the season made landfall at Port Fouchon, severely damaging a facility that is essential to the production of oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico. Heavy rainfall from the remnants of Ida washed out roads in Mississippi and flooded several rivers as far north as the New England states. The high water was responsible for dozens of deaths. In the west, hot dry weather continues to fuel wildfires in Northern California. The resort city of South Lake Tahoe lay squarely in the path of the colder fire. And more than 20,000 residents have left the area due to mandatory evacuation orders. The fire has charred over 200,000 acres since August 14th, 
only 25% of the fire is contained, with nearly 4,500 fire personnel facing numerous obstacles to combating the blaze. We've experienced very erratic winds, uh, very high temperatures and very low humidities, and we're in areas that haven't burned in, in, on some records for decades or even 100 years. It's created a huge challenge for firefighters who are, are working to try to contain the incident. Ample rainfall in the upper Midwest reduced drought conditions in Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. Flash flood warnings were issued in northern Iowa, where heavy rains pushed rivers and streams out of their banks. The U.S. Drought Monitor also revealed widespread improvements in conditions for the Gopher State and much of the High Plains. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. As a chemist, Louis Pasteur gets credit for discoveries involving pasteurization, microbial fermentation, and vaccinations. His work in understanding the causes of diseases has helped nearly eradicate rabies and anthrax. Those viruses still exist, and as Colleen Bradford Kranz explains in our cover story, the fight continues. Betsy Haley is holding the line. Plotting where the enemy might next attempt to cross the mountains, she has just dispatched the fifth flight of the day. The enemy she's fighting? Rabies. A virus, fatal if left untreated, that has struck fear in humans for generations. In the United States, however, the rabies threat doesn't look like it used to when it comes to host animals. It's less of this and more of this. In the early part of the 1900s, dogs were the primary carriers in the U.S. But between public awareness campaigns and the enactment of dog vaccination mandates in most states, that has changed. Today, wildlife are more likely to carry rabies than the nation's domestic animals. Foxes and bats have been a constant threat, but the bigger danger in recent decades came from skunks and raccoons. Haley and others at USDA's Wildlife Services have been working to help reduce the prevalence among raccoons and other wildlife. The focus is actually on raccoons and skunks because those are the animals that seem to encounter humans more, uh, especially raccoons. Raccoons seem to be that warm, fuzzy critter that everybody wants to get closer to or befriend. Since the 1990s, officials have been crisscrossing the countryside in planes and helicopters, dropping vaccine-filled packets covered with a sweet coating to attract the raccoons. Our work is to distribute oral rabies vaccine baits for raccoons, uh, starting from Maine down to Alabama. And my main focus is coordinating all of that and helping to map the areas that we're going to distribute the baits in. When the raccoon variant of rabies began moving north from Florida in the 1940s, and was accidentally accelerated by some trappers in the 1970s, federal officials took notice and began a campaign to confine the disease. Fortunately, the Appalachian Mountains offered a natural barrier that slowed the progression of the virus. An additional drag was placed on the migration of the disease by the development and distribution of these rabies vaccines. The battle, however, isn't over. Rabid raccoon attacks still happen today along the East Coast. <laughs> Lori Rose says she spotted the raccoon when she heard her chicken, Alice, squawking Saturday evening. That's when she came outside to put Alice in her pen. It just charged me. And I slipped and it grabbed a hold of my heel and it would not let go. You could Rabid raccoon attacks still happen today along the East Coast. The Boston area woman, bitten earlier this summer, receive the proper rabies treatment quickly, which is key to surviving exposure through a bite or scratch. The command center for the raccoon rabies bait drop on this particular day in August was the airport near North Lima in eastern Ohio. Over four days, the team would distribute 700,000 bait packets. This project itself is covering 
portions of eastern Ohio, western Pennsylvania, and a little bit of northern West Virginia. We chose this area because it is the western edge of the raccoon rabies front. In many states, although it can fluctuate, the number of rabies-infected wildlife appears to be declining over the past 15 years. That includes Ohio, where wildlife biologist Jeff Rains is based. At the height of the, the raccoon rabies positives in Ohio, we had over 20 cases of rabies um, in a calendar year. And um, through the work of the Ohio Rabies Management Program and the National Rabies Management Program, there's been a, a decline in, in the number of cases per year. In 2020, we only had one positive animal. And so far in 2021, we have only found one. Officials with Wildlife Services drop the packets over the woods and fields where raccoons are likely to live, avoiding releasing over homes or populated areas. Through complex um, calculations, the, the National Rabies Management Program staff um, determine how many baits need to go out in a certain area. So for this flight, I'll, we'll have roughly 12,000 baits, and that can fluctuate from 10 to 20,000 baits, depending on the area that we're working. We'll have a total of 15 flights today. Anyone who finds a bait packet should put on gloves before picking it up and moving it to a wooded area. And no matter what, avoid going near raccoons, particularly if they are stumbling around or acting strangely. If you do get bitten, the best thing to do is to clean and wash that infected area, and then contact your health, local health department immediately. The number of humans dying from rabies has dropped over time, and it is now rare in the U.S. Just a few years ago, however, a Delaware woman died of the disease. State officials say she may have been exposed to rabies through a scratch from a feral cat or one of her own. She was the state's first confirmed rabies death in 77 years. While eliminating all variants of rabies from the U.S. may be impossible because of the difficulty in delivering vaccines to bats, the variant often carried by raccoons could be eliminated. The ultimate goal is to eradicate rabies from the eastern U.S. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. USDA announced a change in their September crop production report that could ultimately update planted and harvest acreage estimates. The market is moving ahead of next week's report and also digesting ample rain and shipping problems in Louisiana. For the week, December wheat subtracted six cents while the nearby corn contract declined 30 cents. Timely rains has some saying it could help fill pods, but others contend it's too little too late. The November soybean contract shed 31 cents. December meal lost 11.40 per ton. December cotton fell 82 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, October class three milk futures added 15 cents. A down week in the livestock sector, October cattle cut 433. October feeders shed $5.95, and the October lean hog contract dropped $1.15. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index lost 65 ticks. October crude oil improved 44 cents per barrel. Comex gold expanded 12.60 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index increased nearly six points to finish at 5.33.40. Now here to provide insight is market analyst Jeff French. Hello, Jeff. Paul, great to be here. Good to have you here. Uh, you didn't have to bring your raincoat. We had that last week. Did this rain have a major impact on wheat as it did on maybe corn and soybeans? Uh, you know, somewhat. Uh, and I mean it from a planning perspective moving forward. Well, they're, they're waiting on the rains. I mean, if you look at Kansas, uh, they want to get some moisture to plant the crop. Um, but... You know, I look at the price action in the wheat. We had Stance Canada come out here earlier in the week. Uh, friendly report. Canada's crop is down 35%. You know, it's well telegraphed. They've had a major drought up there. Uh, but the market really didn't react uh, too positive. I mean, it had some outside reactions to what's going down down in the south. But, uh, you know, this wheat is high price. You got $7 new crop wheat. And uh, I anticipate that you're going to see more acres go on the ground next year. Well, and that's... 
partially my weather question, but also partially the other question. When you're over seven dollars, the wheat, uh, the, the the acreage battle. So, do you think wheat is the biggest winner in 2022 for acres? Uh, right now, I think you know if if Kansas can get the moisture, uh, I anticipate you know wheat will see you know probably upwards of two to three million additional acres. Uh, I have clients in Kansas right now that are. Um, you know, looking into putting wheat underneath their pivots. Oh. And that is simply because of the inputs on the corn. They're so expensive. Uh, with new crop wheat at $7, you can lock that in right now, have it protected here for all of growing season. $7 wheat is, is a moneymaker. Quickly, are you getting rid of any wheat right now? I have no problem. We're, we're sold out of old crop. Um, new crop, we're upwards of 20% sold. Uh, but again, $7 wheat, it makes money. Uh, get some booked here but also protect the downside. In case there is, I mean, there could be some more upside here. I mean, that crop up in uh, the hard red spring wheat could continue to get smaller. Uh, that could attract some buying, but you know, these are really good prices. Uh, you need to be defensive here. Are these good prices in corn? I mean, they're money making prices. I mean, this crop, this crop went in when, uh, you know, it was $3 inputs. So we've had a big rally here uh, in the last year. Now here, short term, we're kind of on a downslope. Um, you know, we held support at 520. Uh, we need to continue to hold that because if we take out 520 in December, 501 is the 200 day moving average. This week, we close below the 20, 50, and 100 day moving average in corn. We have not done that in a year. So you have these funds uh, that control a lot of bushels. And when we start taking out those moving averages like that, they don't want to be holding on to those long contracts. And right now, they're long about 200,000 contracts of corn. You know, if we start taking out that 501, they're going to quickly sell the remaining. We have a question about round numbers in corn we'll get to in Market Plus. So I'll ask you, though, now, do those moving average closures underneath them prompt you, if I'm a grower sitting with a decent crop in my fields, am I booking some more sales right now in that, say, December? Well, I, you know, again, corn right now is making money at 520 or 525. A lot of places still have positive bases. Um, if you are selling into this downslide that we've seen here, just get it re-owned. Uh, buy a March call out there for, you can buy a 570 March call for under 20 cents a bushel. You can re-own those bushels for the next six months. Uh, right now, I'm not making sales. Now, if we start closing below 520, I, make, I might get a little more aggressive there. September 10 is a new USDA report, and it's going to be possibly different. The news of recertifying or re-looking at acres. Yeah. Is that a big, big impact on corn? Well, I think it uh, surprised the market a little bit. And that also added to the selling pressure this week. When that was announced, we immediately moved lower. The trade has kind of digested it, and, and the trades uh, kind of anticipates that the acres are going to go upwards of anywhere from 800,000 upwards of 1.2 million more acres of corn. So we'll just have to see what the government says. But for them to come out in September, you know, that raises questions. Does that translate to anything different in the soybean market, that same USDA change? You know, I, I think the market's pretty comfortable with that 89 million. Um, you know, we've had some good rains here. You know, it's, it's late August, early September here. Uh, you know, will they help? That's the question. I don't think they're going to hurt by all means. Um, but most people anticipate that yield in beans are inching upwards. So the market right now is, is pretty comfortable with supply. Okay, well, we have a question about basis and a little bit how it relates to supply. And it came from Jared in Illinois via Twitter. And he's asking us if ending stocks are as tight as they seem for soybeans, why is there a 10 cent under local basis going into harvest? Well, I, you know, I, I've traveled a lot here this summer and, and I've been talking to uh, producers all over the Midwest. And, and I'm shocked at how many producers I talk to that are 0% sold. Uh, and this is within the last month of being out on the road. So I think, you know, the market kind of anticipates that, you know, the, the, the American farmer has not sold a lot of new crop. Uh, you know, last year they still had the sour taste of selling, you know, new crop beans at $10 and then watching it go up to 14 by the end of the year. Well, you know, we have $13 beans right now. Uh, these are very good high prices. These prices are typically associated with a crop disaster. And I, don't, I just don't see a disaster out there. Right before we started, executive producer Dave Miller showed me, he quizzed me on a close sheet. When is this from? And it was right about $13. It was from 2012. That was a catastrophic crop year. 
Are we in a catastrophic crop year with these prices? No. I mean, so does that mean books and sales? I, again, when 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 you are a grain producer and you can make money off of the crop that you put in the ground and six months later harvest it and you can make money, I'm not going to tell you to never sell that because that's what we're in to do. We're not into being right. It's about making money. And these prices make money, get some sold, but again, defend it with some call options out into March. All right. I asked you about cotton if we could talk about it and you said yes, and there's a reason why. What's the big flat line against that uh, market. brick wall at 95 cents. I, I mean, we, we've tested it here for about three weeks. Uh, we traded above it for, for about an hour during the trading session. So uh, get some cotton sold. Uh, if we can close above 95 cents for two days consecutively, buy everything back that you sold because we are going to go higher. But again, these are good prices. Get some sold up here. Back to round numbers again. All right, let's get into livestock. Uh, this is something, two consecutive weeks where everything had been on the rise. Why the fall this week? Let's start with live cattle. Well, I, I think you saw, you know, live cattle went up there and made multi-year highs after the cattle on feed, you know, didn't give us the bearish surprise. Uh, we hit 138 in December. I mean, historically, uh, December cattle at 138 are very expensive. I mean, you can count on one hand how many times we've hit 138. So. You saw, number one, longs take some profits, but also you saw producers saying, hey, these are good prices, let's get some protection. So you've seen a lot of hedge pressure coming into this market. Somebody was maybe listening to someone saying, these are good prices, multi-years, take advantage. So feeder-wise, um, there's a theory that maybe we need a leg lower to go back higher. Is this a technical move ahead for feeders or a fundamental story? Uh, I think it's technical. There, there's some gaps on the charts that we put on in July that now we're within a dollar, dollar and a half of filling those gaps. And gaps typically in the livestock market, they get filled. Uh, we also had the August 22 uh, uh, feeder cattle contract come on the board last week. It opened at 174. Uh, that is a very good price long yeah. term. So uh, again, producers are looking at this price and saying, hey, we need to protect it. And that's absolutely what they should be doing. That's a three and a half percent drop this week, 595. So if I'm looking to expand my herd right now, am I in a good position? Yeah, I, I think you wait, um, you know, wait and see the action. We got a long weekend here. Uh, we open lower Tuesday, come back to close higher. I think that would be a good sign. But, you know, right now the cattle market is trending. I mean, we've had nine days in a row where it's lower lows and lower highs. That is not a friendly chart pattern. So let's see if we can stabilize and start moving higher, and then we're going to get back on the long side. So maybe sit out for just a little bit longer? I'd, I'd be a little patient here right now. Okay. Hog market, what do you think of, uh, you know, Asia's having an issue with a lot of, of, of virus issue? Is that impacting what they're willing to take in imports? Well, I, you know, I, I want to be bullish hogs. I, I mean, you just said it. China's continuing to have problems. Germany's having problems. Um, you know, exports this week were large. Now China had a small cancellation or, or reduction. Um, but I just, you know, I, I look at the hog market, we're at 90, 85 cents, 90 cents here up front in the October. Historically, very good prices. And then you have the ASF that's in the Western Hemisphere down in Dominican Republic. You know, that's 90 miles from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is considered a state. So uh, I would be very cautious here. We do not want to see ASF in the states here. All right, I want to spend the last minute discussing this hurricane this week. On the, the what is the, going to be the long-term effect uh, Ida caused in, say, New Orleans? Uh, maybe long-term this harvest season as we finish up 21. You know, from what my sources are saying, we got 10 days that you know we're going to be down here, uh, maybe two weeks. Uh, but we actually dodged a bullet. I mean, from an industry standpoint, because September is our slowest month for exports. So, I mean, from, a, from that side of point for it to hit any time, it, it's probably a good time. If this would have hit uh, late September or October when harvest was going at full speed here in the Midwest, I think you would have seen a much more dramatic move lower um, because it is a very important port. 60% of our ag products flow through New Orleans. Um, but, you know, we've been through this before. They're going to get it up and running as quickly as possible. But it, it's negative near term, but I think we overdid it a little bit. The market overdid it. Yeah. I mean, is that because there was a discussion of was it all shipping or and then the, the rise yesterday, tiny bit of a rise Friday. 
if that was a dead cat bounce, but maybe that's what you're indicating, that maybe it's not as bad as we thought, and that's why the market moved higher. Yeah, you know, markets tend to overdo it real quick. Um, and again, I think the market kind of took a couple day breather. You know, we've been through this before. Uh, there's not too much structural damage. There's a couple are. Mainly it's just getting the power up. And, and from right now, it, I'm here in 10 to 14 days. And there wasn't much old crap to ship anyway. There shouldn't be. I mean, this is, you got a great positive basis right now. You know, by the end of the month, the basis is going to evaporate. So, uh, you know, sell the old crop here. Absolutely. And maybe the new crop too. All right. Jeff French, thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Paul. All right. That'll do it for this installment of Market to Market. We will talk more in Market Plus. So join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. Learning happens even on a holiday weekend. The classroom section of our website provides constant updates to our entrepreneurship, innovation, and commodity market sections. Visit markettomarket.org slash classroom for more. Next week, we look at the logistics post Ida of shipping grain along the Mississippi River. Thank you so very much for watching, and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.